Hi there. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Great. I rarely have a problem with projecting, just should make sense. Um, so today what I want to do is tell you about our efforts to study the earliest generations of galaxies in the universe, um, specifically using blue waters. Um, and before I go on, uh, you know, this was wor work that was not done alone. In fact, it was not done uh, primarily by me. It was done by um, my postdocs and my collaborators uh, and my postdocs, collaborators, postdocs, and so on, you know, all that good stuff. Um, Primarily, I, this was a project that I conceived of with Mike Norman, who's the co-PI on our PREC grant, and then several other people at uh, universities scattered all over the place. And I'm mentioning uh, the handful of folks who have done essentially all of the analysis work with this, uh, including John Wise, Dan Reynolds, Pinkfei uh, Chen, Britton Smith, and Hao Xu. Um, and also, I'd like to thank uh, Manisha Gajbe, who's our technical point of contact, who's been very helpful uh, throughout the whole process of getting, you know, getting things working on Blue Waters and... Uh, listening to me whine about MPI crashes and things like that. So um, anyway, so galaxies are, uh, you know, very interesting objects if you're an astrophysicist. They're the building blocks of the universe. Uh, and so because they're the building blocks of the universe, understanding them is sort of key to understanding a lot of the things that we know about the universe. And in particular, probing things like dark matter and dark energy and some really fundamental questions about what is the universe made up of. Um, also, from the physical side, galaxies are very interesting probes of extreme and complicated physical systems. And so, um, so before I show you uh, more pretty pictures, of which this is one, uh, this is a supernova remnant going off uh, in the first hundred million years of the universe, uh, but before that, let me set the stage a little bit. So let's talk about galaxy evolution. So this is a picture, can we turn the lights down by any chance? Who's our, where's our moderator? Lights? Anyway, um, <laughs> so uh, here is a, uh, here's a picture of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And this is a really interesting image. Um, what they did was take the Hubble Space Telescope and pointed at a very tiny patch of the sky for, I don't know, something like two and a half weeks. Um, and this is such a tiny patch of the sky, it's a, imagine taking a one millimeter squared piece of paper, holding it at arm's length, that's about what it is. And so it's uh, 11 and a half square arc minutes, so very, very teeny tiny. Um, and this is, oops, darn it. Uh, this is one of the deepest images that's ever been taken of the universe in visible light. And every point in here, except for maybe two or three, are galaxies. There's something like 10,000 galaxies in here. And you can see galaxies almost uh, back in time, essentially 13 billion years. And so one of the things that we find when we look at this image, which really is an amazing image, this is, you know, putting it on a projector and in the... In, you know, a semi-lit room doesn't do it justice. You should really go, you know, download it and look at it. Um, but what you can see when you study something like this is that galaxies that are far away look very different than close-up galaxies. And those galaxies that are further away, because light travels at a finite speed, you're looking back in time. So you're using your telescope as a time machine to peer back into time to see how galaxy properties, the properties of galaxies and populations of galaxies have changed over time. And so we see lots of differences. So we see that there are lots of galaxies that are merging. So here are um, you know, lots of pictures pulled out of this Hubble uh, deep field of mergers. Okay, can't get the laser pointer to work, that's all right. Um, and also, we can look at galaxies that are very, very distant. So these are you know, not super exciting pictures, though the most distant galaxies you can see in this image. But uh, when you look at these, you see that they're pretty round, they're full of gas, they're making stars like crazy and they look absolutely nothing like this. This is the Andromeda Galaxy. Uh, many of you might recognize it as the default Mac desktop background, um, <laughs> but it's uh, one of the, it's a, our neighbor galaxy, so it's about 800,000 uh, parsecs away, so a couple million light years away, and it's a, a galaxy that's a, very like the Milky Way. It's a spiral galaxy, it has a big black hole sitting in the middle of it, which someone else is probably gonna talk about how you get those. Um, but this is a very typical galaxy in the modern universe, and it looks nothing like those little red blobs that I was showing you from the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. So there's been this tremendous evolution. And also, I should say that in the next several years, we're going to get tons and tons of new observatories, including the LSST, which NCSA is involved in, and also lots of new astronomical surveys. And we're going to have this just wealth of data on the evolution of galaxies. And so this is what motivates the work that we're doing. And so before we go on, I do want to mention that you know, the way that we think you get from these tiny little galaxies at the beginning of the universe to these much bigger galaxies like this today is by a process called hierarchical structure formation. And the best thing to do is show a movie. So 
what we have here is actually an image that was done by the Advanced Viz Lab here at NCSA. Some of them are sitting in the back of the room right now. Um, and what we're looking at is the formation of, galaxy, of a galaxy like the Milky Way or, and, or Andromeda over several billion years of evolution. And you see this process of hierarchical structure formation um, very vividly. Lots of little things are merging together. You can see it in the background. You can see it in the foreground. Um, and this is a very dynamical process. Stuff merges together. Stars get thrown out. Gas gets ejected. All sorts of things are happening. And so, you know, this, uh, but this process explains how you go from little small amorphous things early on to much bigger, more regular things today. And so, in general, we have that idea, we understand. And I would note, this simulation is pretty old, which is why it looks relatively low resolution. We're working on its, on its replacement because we happen to have a really nice computer to run these things on. Um, anyway, so, okay, so we can simulate these galaxies, but what are the technical challenges? And I think that that's important to talk about in a venue like this. Um, the technical challenges are complicated physics. We have to worry about cosmology, we have the expanding of the universe, and gravity and hydrodynamics and maybe magnetic fields and radiation transport, microphysics of the gas, so chemistry and radiation, radiative heating and cooling and all sorts of things like that. There's lots of physics. Um, it's solved in different ways. Um, and those different pieces of physics interact with each other, often in nonlinear ways. So it's, doesn't, uh, it's not amenable to analytic solution. Um, we also have to deal with dynamic range. The universe is very, very big. And we are very, very small. So we can't simulate from the universe down to us. But you know, if you sort of say, what's a representative size of the universe or a chunk of the universe? And maybe it's a few hundred million light years across, a mere few hundred million light years across. And then what's the smallest scale that we need to understand galaxy formation? Well, maybe that's 100 light years across, right? So the Earth is irrelevant in all of this, you know, that scale. Um, but that still gives you about six orders of magnitude in space. And when you ask the same question about the age of the universe compared to how long it takes stars to form, you get sort of six orders of magnitude as well. So there's this huge dynamic range which presents computational challenges. It's very computationally costly. And then finally, there's the issue of statistics or of sampling because you know, our life scales, our, our lifetime is extremely short compared to both the age of the universe and the age on which pretty much anything interesting happens in galaxy formation. And so what we have to do is simulate lots of galaxies and then go out and compare those simulated populations of galaxies to the observed populations of galaxies. In the observations, there's, you know, we're, we're getting information on hundreds of millions or billions of galaxies. So there's a lot of data to compare to. And we need to be able to simulate lots of galaxies, not necessarily billions, but many. And so, of course, the outcome of having complicated physics and huge dynamic range and, you know, statistics, uh, having to do, you know, lots of galaxies for statistics drives us to something like blue waters. And so we all know what this looks like. But basically, galaxy formation is a blue waters worthy problem. It's complicated. It's big. It's challenging. And so what I want to talk to you about right now is our attempt to understand the first generations of galaxy formation. So in other words, we want to understand how the first galaxies form and how they evolve and how they set the stage for 14 billion years of the universe's evolution. So to form galaxies like the Milky Way and the satellites of the Milky Way. And also, we're really interested in that sort of very, very first little bit of structure formation when the first stars form, so the very first stars in the universe form, and how they impact the beginning of this whole process. So you can imagine this is the, you know, how is that, does that first domino get tipped over and, you know, start this whole cascade that ends up with the galaxies we see today, the Milky Way, Andromeda, things like that. So to do this, <coughs> we use a tool called Enzo which is an adaptive mesh refinement code. Um, it simulates all of those pieces of physics that I was just talking about. Um, it actually uh, started at NCSA back in the mid-90s uh, with Mike Norman and Greg Bryan. Uh, Greg was the one who wrote it. Mike was his, uh, his thesis advisor. And nowadays, it's a, a publicly available code. It's at enzoproject.org. You could go download it and have it installed and running by the time I uh, finish this talk, especially if I go long. Um, and so, um, you know, but it's developed by many people at many different institutions. And so just to give you an idea of how this process works, I'm going to show you one quick movie. So 
Here's a simulation of the universe evolving over many billions of years. And so what you're seeing these little boxes, so the, the colors are just the log of the density of material in the universe, and then these boxes show you where all the adaptive mesh is. And the important thing to note is that out in the blue areas where the density is very low and nothing exciting is happening, there's no mesh there. But the regions where there's lots of stuff happening, the, the blue and green and red, uh, there's adaptive mesh all over the place there because we're resolving the interesting regions. And so we're concentrating all of the computation in the places that we care about and ignoring this, you know, frankly, most of the volume of the universe where nothing exciting is happening from our perspective at least. So, okay. So this is just to give you an idea of how AMR works. So now what I want to do is tell you about these two specific, two specific projects that we're working on, or two specific sets of simulations that we've done on Blue Waters. And so the first thing we did is look at how this very first generation of stars, what we call population three stars, that are made out of just hydrogen and helium, so uh, transitioned the universe from being very uniform and very flat uh, and not very exciting to having galaxy formation. And so we did this in these very little box, small boxes. Um, how many people are astronomers in here real quick? Show of hands? Okay, so let's, so ignore most of the words. So, uh, <laughs> but basically what we're doing is a very small simulation, a very small physical volume by the standards of cosmological simulations, but at exquisitely high resolution. And so what we're doing is simulating just a tiny patch of the universe, which is a million light years across, roughly, or a couple million light years across, um, with lots of this adaptive mesh. So we go down to really, really tiny spatial scales where the gas density is very high. Um, and we follow the evolution of gas clouds until the very first stars form. And then we put in radiation transport. So massive stars produce lots of ultraviolet light, which ionizes all the gas around it and dumps lots of energy into the universe. So we actually follow that process. Then we follow the process of supernovae. So that first star, we assume these are, you know, 50 or 100 solar masses, so really big, much, much bigger than our own sun. They don't live very long. Uh, they explode in these gigantic explosions, and then this explosion scatters metal-enriched gas all over the universe. And the reason we care about metal, by the way, metal means everything heavier than helium uh, to an astronomer. We do that to piss off chemists, mostly. Um, <laughs> but the reason that metal is important is that gas that's just made out of hydrogen and helium can't cool and form stars very, very easily. And so when you put metal into a gas, any of the rest of the periodic table, you know, us, um, it really helps gas cool, and you suddenly go from extremely inefficient star formation to very efficient star formation. And so it just sort of turns the table. You know, you essentially flip the switch on structure formation is what I'm getting at. So we're very, very interested in that. And so these are great simulations. We've done a bunch of them. Um, they're very expensive because radiation transport is an extremely expensive a computational process. And so that's why we needed a computer like Blue Waters is to be able to do this in a sensible amount of time. So what I want to do is show you a couple movies of this. And so these are four panel movies. Uh, top left is the density of gas. And so this is going to evolve forward in time. And so the top left is the density of gas. Top right is the temperature. Bottom left is metals, where there will be nothing initially, and then you'll see some clouds appear when stars blow up. Uh, and then the bottom right is the molecular hydrogen fraction. And so, so the ones I would pay attention to, uh, top left shows you where stuff is forming. Top right shows you when those H2 regions kick on, when the stars are form and forming and start making these big ionized clouds of gas. And then down in the bottom left, you can see when the supernovae kick in. So let's go. Okay. So now you're seeing halos form, oops, stars turned on. So now what we've done is ionize this big piece of the universe and now, oop, kaboom, there goes the supernova. So what this does is it just ejects a ton of stuff. There's another supernova that started over here. And then actually the first metal enriched star forms inside of this cloud of metal enriched gas right here. And uh, we're actually, uh, in the middle of analyzing these simulations right now, so I don't have tons and tons of details, but what I would like to do is actually zoom, dive way down into one of these clouds because we follow this particular simulation over um, a factor of 100 billion in spatial scales. That's 10 to the 11. And so uh, the box size compared to the smallest re resolution element is, you know, two to the 30 somethingth. Um, and so we can zoom in really, really far. So let's go ahead and do that. 
So we're going to dive into this thing. So you see we're diving into this cloud of metal enriched gas. The color table is going to be changing. But you can see it's always dense right in the center because we're aiming for this first generation or this, this first metal enriched star. And so we go in and in and in and in and in. And then um, you can see over here there's a lot of molecular hydrogen because that forms in dense regions. And then up here what you can see is a bunch of little dense spots. And what we're forming is an association of, you know, so, so several metal enriched stars. And so this is truly the first galaxy. And that's very, very exciting. And so this halo is really small. Uh, the stars that are forming in it, we actually don't know anything about them yet, uh, since the simulations are still being analyzed. But, you know, they're much smaller than these huge population three stars. Um, and they don't have much metal in them by the standards of the present day. And so when we want to study stars like this, we essentially have to go out and look at really small, really old galaxies out in the universe and try to compare what we're seeing in our simulations to those. But what we're seeing here is very exciting because we're seeing how exactly this metal, you know, the metal from those first pop three stars pollutes all the stuff around it and how that first generation of star, uh, metal enriched stars forms. So this, this tip over um, in really exquisite detail and that's very, very exciting. So, okay, so then moving on to something where we've had a little bit more time to do more analysis. Um, we've been looking at really early galaxy populations. And so this is uh, bigger volumes, so a factor of maybe a hundred larger on each edge, so a million times larger in volume, and the resolution isn't quite as good. But here, what we're trying to say is, how do the early populations of galaxies evolve? And this gets back to that point that I was making before about statistics, where you know, we, can't, we, we can learn some useful things qualitatively from single galaxies and from single stars, but if we really want to understand populations, or if we want to think, if we want to really be confident we're doing something right, we have to look at a population of simulated galaxies versus a population of, say, observed galaxies from that Hubble deep field. Um, so what we're doing is this, this large volume where we pick a piece of it that looks really exciting and we zoom in on that and we do uh, adaptive mesh down to you know, a pretty good spatial resolution, or well, extremely good for uh, uh, cosmological simulations, pretty good compared to the other thing that we were doing. Um, and then in this simulation, we formed Ten, more than 10,000 of these population three stars, and then more than 1,000 halos that have metal-enriched star formation in them by about 500 million years after the Big Bang. And so we see more than one of these population three stars forming in each halo. We, uh, by the end of the simulation, we see lots and lots of star formation forming all over the place. And so just to give you some idea, here is an image. It looks really choppy up on the screen. I apologize. But this is... Um, a volume of the universe that's about 10 million light years across. And so what you're looking at is every sort of yellow and red spot here is a galaxy. It's full of thousands of galaxies. Many of them are forming stars. Um, here is the radiation. So this is the temperature field. So it shows you all those H2 regions, all the ionizing light from all of the galaxies. Um, and so you can see bubbles of this. And so we know that the universe reionizes. as it goes from being totally neutral to totally ionized somewhere around a billion years after the Big Bang. Um, this is not all ionized, little pieces of it are, but we're looking at the first parts of this sort of fundamental shift in the universe. And then what we can do is plot up all the metals. And so the stuff in the middle is really metal enriched, the stuff at the edges is really metal poor, and it shows you where all the feedback is occurring from all of these galaxies. And so this also looks a lot more like modern art than anything else. So I've been given the one minute warning. So what I'm gonna do is uh, skip all of the slides that I was going to show you with plots and plots and plots, but since there's only a few astronomers in the room, no big deal. Um, but really, what I want you to do uh, to take away from this talk is we're using blue waters to perform these incredibly high dynamic range, very physics rich simulations of the earliest galaxies and the earliest stars in those galaxies. And so what we see in these simulations is that you know, the transition between metal-free stars, so these population three stars, and metal-enriched stars is locally very complicated. There's a lot of mixing going on, there are blast waves going all over the place, and globally it takes place over hundreds of millions of years, so that's kind of neat. Um, so you have metal-poor stars, or metal-free stars, and metal-rich stars that are all existing at the same time. 
Um, we also think that from some of the plots that I didn't get to show you, that these pop three stars, these, these primordial stars, may actually be really significant sources of heating and ionizing radiation in the early universe, which has some implications for how galaxies form. Um, and the other interesting thing is that our simulated galaxies bear sort of shocking similarities to the Milky Way's satellite galaxies. So when we look around the Milky Way, we see these old galaxies that had, you know, haven't been forming stars for 13 billion years, and they look a lot like what we're seeing in our simulations, and that's very, very encouraging. So thank you very much.